Hey guys, got a special video for you today. I am in a secret, undisclosed location, actually in somebody's rec room or uh, basement, and I have a collection of World War I, World War II, a little bit of everything here, a lot of memorabilia and some guns. I'm here with Mike, who's going to kind of walk through his collection. And the good news is a lot of this stuff is going to be coming home with me, which means you're going to be able to have access to it on our website. But first, let's just have a fireside chat. I'd like to tell you this is the original uh, fireplace that uh, Roosevelt had, but it, it's not. Uh, but let's show you some real original items coming up. Uh, but how did you get started, Mike? And tell us a little bit about some of these items here. I got started when I was about five years old. I got in the attic and found my dad's World War II uh, duffel bag full of his clothing and stuff from World War II. Went through it, wore it all out after about 10 years, and just been buying stuff ever since. This is my wow. grandfather's stuff. Uh, he was a in the 308th Engineers. He was a uh, lieutenant, then became captain in France, and he uh, won the Corps de Guerre in France for bravery. This is his Corps de Guerre right here. And this is all his, uh, his gear. Oh, your, his revolver is here, I see. Let's yes. pull that out. You have a confession to make about this revolver. Tell us about it. My grandfather came to live with us when, we, when I was about 12 years old, and there was an old beat up suitcase that was in his uh, apartment building in the basement. We pulled it in, had it in the corner of our basement for several months. I opened it up one day, and there was a rusted Smith & Wesson 1917 45 in there, loaded with half-moon clips. So being rusted and being 12 years old and not knowing what I was doing, I took it and had it reblued. Oh! <laughs> uh, Kirk, get a close-up on this. You can see it's U.S. Army issued. I have taken the... And so that shiny blue is not original? No. There's okay. one over there. But I have taken the grips off and the grips are numbered to the gun. Okay, good. Here's his 45 Colt case. I don't have the gun for that. Okay. <laughs> uh, is that a hangman's noose down there? No, this is, this is, he was in the engineers and they carried this, uh, he also was horseback. And I have his saddlebags as well, but this was uh, to tie his horse up, I guess. I don't know. Okay. They all had this, though. They all carried this. Uh, so here, check this out. There's a uh, picture of his grandfather. Do you guys see, uh, stand beside that so we can, is there a family resemblance, do you think? I think they are both <laughs> tough looking dudes. I love the boots, by the way. And the, the pants, what, what is that called? Bloom or whatever? Bloomers, yeah. Bloomers, okay. Jodhpurs. Jodhpurs, yes. Jodhpurs. Well, that's it, she's right. So Mike, you just talked about your grandfather, but you told me you also have some memorabilia from your, from your dad. Yeah, this is my dad. In World War II, he was in the Army Air Corps. He went in the Marine Corps initially and then decided he didn't like marching so much, so he went into the Air Corps, transferred over, and to be a pilot, then got bumped out of the pilot school when they didn't need any more pilots. But he was a uh, first sergeant, uh, door gunner on a uh, B-24, and here he is sitting in a B-24 in the nose turret of a B-24 with the 50 caliber machine guns. Those are his wings from World War II, and those are my wings uh, underneath. So you were a paratrooper? Yes, I was. Oh. And this is his hat, his uh, skull cap. Uh, this is uh, some, some of the, I guess this was his bracelet? His identification bracelet. Okay. Yeah. All right. And that's World War II? Yes. And when did you serve? I served from uh, 1973 to 1992. This patch? Very cool. Must have been on a jacket. Yes. 
That was the uh, insignia for his unit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, was this his? No. Okay. Well, I'll show you this since it's here. <laughs> uh, World War II era, maybe? Oh, she definitely. Each one of this is a B-24, and it's called the Flak Magnet II. The first one was shot down. Each one of these bombs is a mission that they flew, a hostile mission in Germany. So, Mike, you were going to tell me a little bit about this femoral. I bought this off a lady whose father is written up in the book Company Commander. He was a lieutenant during World War II. And when I bought the femoral, I also bought <clears throat> a German flag with it. And everyone in his company and his squad is named on that flag. They all put their names on it. And as well, I got an SS enlisted man's visor cap with it. I still have it. Okay. I'll, I'll have to keep this all together because when we do put these together for sale, I want to keep as many things together as they came back. Speaking of comeback, this guy could work for Legacy Collectibles. I don't know if you can focus in on that. Uh, but this, he's the kind of soldier that Legacy dreams about. 1914 Mauser, 32 caliber, uh, on the front strap. Oh, here's the uh, holster to go with it. Front strap, it has a police marking. Um, these actually sell uh, relatively cheap compared to other collectible guns. So um, I'm not going to say if you're cheap, <clears throat> but if your budget is less, this is an <laughs> ideal uh, bring back for some people. These two are interesting in that they both are late war. Uh, you can tell from the serial number. Also, they're AC marked. Um, but they are not, uh, they're not test fired. So there's no firing proofs, no Eagle N. So that means they were in the factory when the GIs uh, came into the factory. Uh, where did you get these from? A fellow called me one day, said, I have some uh, World War II stuff. I went to his house. They were on his couch with a G43 with a scope on it that was unfired from the factory and an SS General's visor cap, an SS General's mess jacket, and an SS General's um, summer coat. Wow. All that, the insignia on it. Great find. Uh, for you, uh, this is a World War I era Luger, uh, DWM. Uh, do you know what that crest is for? I've seen one other in my 50 years of collecting it. I believe it's Italian. Okay. It's uh, import marked. So that would be, okay, this would be a custom embellishment, not from the factory, but somebody embellished it. Uh, but it is a World War I uh, era Luger. This artillery, of course, is World War I. I'm going to bet it's a 1917. And I am right. It's 1917. <laughs> the reason I could bet that is most of the ones you find will be 1917. All original finish, uh, beautiful gun. These come in 9mm. And then uh, a couple more Lugers. Uh, this is a DWM commercial 9mm. And it's, oh, it does have some imperial proofs. Again, uh, this one is uh, dated 1914. Uh, it's, it's been through the war, a little bit, little bit worn, uh, but it is marked on the front for a machine gun unit. You probably can't see that. Sorry, I'm so far away, but uh, that is marked to a machine gun unit. And the last Luger on this table, because we got to keep moving, Mike, um, unless we're staying for dinner. That, you, you're more than welcome. <laughs> That's a sneak. Okay, uh, this is what they call a sneak. It was between the wars. They were technically not allowed to make Lugers because of the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, so this one kind of snuck in there. So this is a DWM made Luger, but there is no marking on the toggle. Uh, before I move on, on this table, I skipped two guns and a couple of you saw that I skipped them. And you say, hold on, uh, this is a, uh, a, a 1903 mm -hmm. pocket hammer. Yeah, this is... Um, this is a 1903 Colt pocket hammer. Um, just a really cool looking gun. They also made the hammerless. This design actually was not as popular as the 1903 hammerless mm -hmm. because if you, uh, if you uh, watch our website, you'll see a lot more of the hammerless. I think there's about a half a million of those made and there was only about 10 or 20,000 of these made. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, the design was not as popular because the design was really taken over by the 1911. This is not a 1911. This is a uh, 38 Super, and the condition is super. If you take a look at the gloss on that finish, you see how nice that is, but then you can see this is a, a duller finish, and also on the top is what I call a matte finish, and then a high polish uh, slide. 
um, before moving on, I said that once before, Mike pointed out, see, I was going to skip over this because it is an ugly looking gun. I, I apologize because I know people say there are no ugly guns. Uh, this is an FN. I believe it's a 1900. There's no finish at all. But Mike, uh, this is a special gun. Tell us a little bit about it. This is a shoulder holster for the gun. It was carried in World War II, actually prior to World War II, our involvement, by one of the first 12 Flying Tigers that went over to China under uh, General Chenault. And he was, the, I got it directly from the fella. He was in the ground crew, and they had 12 of the ground crew went over before the pilots came to get the airplanes ready for when the pilots arrived. And that, he carried this throughout the war. That's, that's very cool. Uh, just to increase the value by 50%. This is a, a jacket for a gliderman. I have his name and whatnot in there in the pocket. This is a Walt Disney patch. Walt Disney Studios created this. And if you see, it's got the character pulling a, an airplane. Oh. He was a glider pilot, so he was pulling a glider, and he also dropped paratroopers. And he's dropping a paratrooper underneath there. This one looks more recent. It's World War II, just not worn as much. Okay. These guys have been through it, as you can tell. Wow. I love to see this. I love to see the use. Yeah. This is a Bugs Bunny, the uh, Wild Hairs unit, World War II. Now, Mike, you said you used to get together with these guys and tell stories. Um, I hear these jackets are total chick magnets. Is that true? <laughs> I, uh, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's try one on and just walk around a little bit. <laughs> I got my chick right over there. <laughs> this is a, a unique jacket here. It's got the leather shoulder patches. An American flag, theater-made shoulder patch, and a unit patch, and then another unit patch here, a squadron patch, the name of the pilot, pilot, and each mission he flew. And he also was a B-24 pilot. You got the devil there? That's a Navy jacket. These were all Army Air Corps. That one's okay. Navy. Navy, okay. I wouldn't have guessed that. This one's interesting. This was a, uh, this is not a government jacket. This is this fellow was a uh, flight instructor, so he was a pilot before World War II and trained pilots under government auspices in World War II. And that's actually plexiglass, his patch, from the uh, windshield of an airplane, and there's his logbook. Okay, so a lot of these come with some documentation. And, of course, yes. as they go up on the site, um, our uh, YouTube viewers will want to get a shot at some of this. This case is full of all authentic World War II paratrooper patches. These are jacket patches and tunic patches that they wore unauthorized, but that's what they came up with per unit. This particular patch was made on the way back from Corregidor. The 503rd was the, uh, they call them the rock, because they jumped on Corregidor, and Corregidor was a rocky island toward the end of the war. That, ja that patch was actually cut from an M42 jump jacket and painted on the boat coming back. It's the only known first issue of that patch. This newspaper is the New York Herald and it's printed on April 15, 1865, the day that Abraham Lincoln was shot. And it's the original paper and they started printing their papers from left to right during that time and you can see that in the middle, it says he was shot, and then over here it says he died, as the news caught up with uh, the event. World War I and World War II, trench knives, knuckle knives, fighting knives, and it's a collection, as well as paratrooper switchblades. The switchblades were issu issued to paratroopers. In case they landed in a tree, you could cut your way out of it with one hand. These are various kinds. This one's homemade. A, a father sent this to his son in World War II in the Pacific. Kind of a big, heavy, clunky thing. This was made from a uh, Civil War bayonet. The government made them. They cut down the bayonets and made the uh, fighting knives, the knuckle knives. Then we have just various. Uh, this is a, a New Zealand-made knuckle knife. And these are just various manufacturers of knuckle knives. LF and C was the big one right here, the brass handle with the spike on the end. Very collectible knives. This one was a paratrooper knife, a gentleman in the 505th Airborne, World War II. Um, and you can see just various LFs and Cs and uh, Alarons, which is a French make. 
These two are um, Australian made or New Zealand made knives, sold to the paratroopers and they're on duty there. Now this one in the corner is a Gerber. That was my fighting knife in uh, the 70s. And now it's collectible. What's that tell you about? <laughs> <laughs> it's a very collectible knife today. Now, one thing that Legacy Collectibles doesn't really deal with is a lot of these flintlocks. So we don't know much about them, but we'll just show them to you. They are um, all original flintlocks made in the 1700s and maybe a, a little bit into the early 1800s. Um, and then, Mike, uh, you see a bit of history here, uh, some Confederate history. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit about that? That saber in the middle of that flag was my great, great, great uncle's saber, and he rode with the Richmond Cavalry. But it's a U.S. saber. He took it off a, um, a northern soldier in some fashion and carried it for the rest of the war. And supposedly he walked back home from Appomattox carrying that sword. So the pistol was period correct from the Civil Eight, War? 1860. Uh, it is from 1860 Colt. You've seen these before on our site. This one is military proof, so it was used probably on the Union side. So mm -hmm. probably when you go to bed at night, the two of these guys probably battle it out a little <laughs> bit. And when you see a racket in the basement, that's what's going on. We have an assortment of uh, bayonets and some daggers. Uh, starting all the way in, in front, uh, we have some Japanese swords, katanas. Uh, from World War II, captured in battle. Uh, we also have Japanese bayonets, uh, German K-98 bayonets. I, I should point out that these are among the nicest bayonets as, you know, as they came out of the factory, this is what they looked like. Uh, we will be offering these, so stay tuned. This is dated 44. I'm not surprised. I was going to say it had to be 44 or 45. Uh, this is unique in that it's a K-98 scabbard with a Russian, Russian bayonet in it, and this is the way it was captured uh, in World War II and brought back. Um, and then all the way down at the end, we have uh, some swords. We'll kind of sort through this and do some research, but uh, some German, and um, what else do we have here, Mike? It's German. This is World War I German. Okay, World War I. I was going to say I didn't recognize that one. These are all engraved swords. These are all, all uh, Okay, these. We'll, we'll get close up. This is a, um, an Italian... Is that a boot knife? No. Oh, how holding about bayonet. That? Oh, how about that? Don't cut yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Tell you what, there's the coolest gun in the whole house. There's a Buck Jones Daisy BB gun from 1930. Oh, look at that. <laughs> uh, that's, that's the first one I've seen of these. You got your compass so you don't get lost in the woods. You got a sundial. This has got to be a Boy Scout kind of thing. You put a match in there for the sundial. And it still works. You know, what's interesting is our viewers, somebody will say, I had one of these growing up and I want to buy it. <laughs> if you had one growing up, let us know. Uh, very cool. Carried by a paratrooper in World War II. <laughs> not, not true. Made that up. Um, let's take a look at some Japanese rifles. Japanese rifles. This one has the original monopod and it has the full mum. That's always good to see. They almost all do. They, yeah. Uh, almost there. Mike just told me almost all of these. Uh, this one is ground, but most of these have the full mon, and then we also have bayonets to go with them. Uh, Reproduction. So all, yeah, all different. Yeah, this one has a full mon, all different categories, and this one is paratrooper. Um, take a look here. You can see that. We'll show it later. You unscrew it here. Uh, this will come apart. I did a whole video just on the uh, paratrooper. Um, Japanese rifle. And we also have some on the wall. Come on over. This whole wall is uh, very nicely decorated with uh, Japanese Imperial Army weapons. And there's quite an assortment here, starting with this uh, very cool training rifle. It looks all authentic. Um, however, it is a training rifle and does not shoot. So they would use this for training. I assume this is very, very rare. I'm not sure what the value is. It has the dust cover on it. Um, and they need practice with that because I know this would fall off pretty easily. Um, but also, you do see um, the samurai swords. Uh, what's interesting about these swords, I do see samurai swords that were captured in World War II. But here we have some officer swords, um, Japanese officer swords, uh, that are not samurai, but look more like the Western-style sword. Um, also, 
Uh, mountain mountain carbine uh, in go gorgeous condition. Some very rare items here. Full mum. Um, you can tell this is a long time collection because if you go to gun shows today, you almost never find this kind of quality stuff. Uh, this is a uh, sniper rifle. I did a whole video on the sniper rifle. I knew I know a customer right now. I'm thinking of who will want to buy this, um, but that is the sniper rifle. And then uh, finally, just a beautiful condition paratrooper rifle. Uh, I mentioned before it has the artillery uh, sight. Um, and, I mean, for aviation, has a, a artillery and aviation sight. And then it comes uh, comes apart for the paratrooper. And this has a full mum on it as well. The condition on the finish is just almost new. It's like 98, 99%. Okay, we came from the Japanese wall, and here's one of my favorite walls, the uh, German items. Uh, just a great assortment. Uh, Artillery Luger P38. We got some K98s and uh, a couple of special guns. And, Mike, why don't you tell us a little bit about this one? It caught my eye. This MP44, a friend of mine was walking across a bridge in Germany and looked down in the stream and found this. Saw this setting right in the water. You can see that how fragile that is. In 1980, it's obviously a relic. Could never ever be made to fire, but it's pretty pretty darn cool. That is, that is very cool. <laughs> uh, a great find. Um, I have a video. Our most popular video is about a Springfield that was dug up on a battlefield, and uh, it's uh, in a little better condition than this one. Uh, you have an MP40 here. Uh, uh, you said it's uh, parts, but the receiver is a dummy. Right. Uh, so that has been made safe. It's kind of neat. This uh, was sent to me. This was uh, this is from the uh, Hermann Goering, General Goering Division. You can tell by the white epaulets, the white piping on the Luftwaffe, um, and the cuff title. Very rare to find these in a cuff title. It's an early German turret with a droop tail eagle. Okay, 100% right. It's even on a hanger from a clothing shop from World War II in Germany. The fellow that had this, again, the information is right there, um, was a prisoner of war. At the end of World War II, when the, the Germans were quickly leaving their prison camps, this was an enlisted man's jacket, um, the, the Germans left, the prisoners were on their own, he went into the barracks, found this jacket hanging there, sent it home to a friend of his, and I bought it off the friend. This one is a... Um, Yes, a police officer's lieutenant, lieutenant Stoenig, um, who was at one time in the SS. Okay, when you have the SS runes down here, it means he was either working with the SS or was in the SS previously. And this has the Aguilette on it, uh, brown cuffs for rural police, and the beautiful bullion insignia on there. Mm. Film police, film police uh, tunic, this guy would have been has the royal bars on it, but he would have been wearing this HBT tunic in the, in the, uh, in the field. This is a P-38, original holster, and these papers were in the holster. This is the uh, capture papers, secondary capture papers, and then we have the uh, location where it was made, when it was made, and uh, what company. There's a close-up of the gun for, that goes with the capture papers. That strap is excellent. The other side, P38 and 9mm, CYQ spree work. Uh, just for equal time, we do have a, a wall for the Americans. And notice the American flag. We showed you a Confederate flag, a Nazi flag, a Japanese flag. This is an American flag. Um, we go from Civil War all the way down to modern. That's a, actually an AR-15. The top is the Civil War, uh, 1860s um, Springfield. Uh, then we have a trap door, which we've sold those before, a rare trowel at the end. I guess uh, digging, uh, digging up some dirt, but you could also use it to stab someone. It's got the rack number. Uh, this is a crag um, with an Eddystone. These were World War I, and this is actually original ammo. Eddystone is right outside of Philadelphia, by the way, and so is the Franklin Arsenal. So uh, the ammo and the gun uh, from World War I. And while we're there, uh, just take a quick look here. We have uh, two uniforms from World War I from the 82nd Division. Uh, also a, uh, a 1911 
And that looks like World War I era. So we have quite a bit of World War I memorabilia here. And then we go to the 1903 Springfield, which uh, we saw these, this end of World War I, but they used them a lot all the way into World War II. But actually, I just read where they were using these in Vietnam for sure. sniper rifles. So yes. um, out of the Grand, you're all, um, you're all familiar with the Grand, M1 Grand, and then the M1 Carbine. Um, so this whole wall, and don't forget a World War II uniform, uh, this whole wall is dedicated to U.S. arms and uh, the various wars that we fought from Civil War all the way to recent times. Hey, sorry I had to cut it a little short. I'm back at the office now, you can kind of tell. The reason I had to cut it off short is actually we were running out of battery. Toward the end, you could hear the sound was getting a little garbled, and that was because the batteries were wearing out. And that's because we walked into a, a surprise situation. I went out there not realizing how much Mike had. I, I was blown away by it. We were thinking we were going to go out and bring everything back. The truth is, uh, we went out there and I was completely overwhelmed. We spent hours going through all of the items he has. Um, and instead of bringing it all back, we only brought back about 12 items out of 1,500. What that means for you as the viewer is that over time, we're going to be bringing things back and going over them with you. Uh, so you have a lot to look forward to. I would estimate it could take as much as a year to get it all back. Couple reasons. One, it's several hours away driving back and forth, but also Mike wasn't ready to get rid of it all. I mean, he was ready to begin to uh, let some of it go. So we will bring that to you. You will be very tempted to say, I want everything on the wall. Be patient as we get the items. We'll bring them to you by video. Also, most of you are jealous because you're thinking, I want Mike's basement. Well, there's a couple, uh, couple things you need to have uh, before you can have Mike's basement. One is you need an understanding spouse. <laughs> Uh, and he has that uh, because uh, not everybody would be thrilled with having their, their basement turned into a museum. Uh, two, you obviously need a little bit of money. Uh, but three, you also need patience. And that has to do with the money. You may not have the money. I know we, we have a lot of young view viewers who actually get discouraged because they can't afford it. Well, look at Mike. He was Special Forces, paratrooper, Vietnam, then a police officer. And look at what he has accomplished with what I would consider a medium income. But if you're patient, I believe that you can really get a collection, maybe not as good as that, but certainly uh, a collection to be proud of. So hang in there, be patient, and keep watching. Make sure you like and subscribe to our channel because I'm gonna be bringing you more of Mike's treasures.